Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing very well. Today is something very exciting. If you're a nerd like me and you like sitting in bed at night thinking about trigonometry angles and radar like I do, this is really exciting. Today we're going to be looking at radar track lock oversplash. Now this video has been requested by a chap named Wolf, W-O-L-V-E, on Discord and he set some exact parameters of what he wants testing. The problem is now a month later I've come to actually make the video, uh, he's disappeared. I can't find him anywhere on my Discord server, I can't find him on Hoggit Reddit, I can't find him on Hoggit Discord. I've asked Hoggit and no one's ever heard of him apparently, so this guy's just phantom disappeared. So nothing I can do about that, which is a real shame because he sent me diagrams of everything he wanted testing. So I'm just going to have to do the best I can from memory. And what we're going to be doing in this case is testing how DCS models radar oversplash and what is radar oversplash and why is it caused. First thing to say is that radar oversplash is a term that I, Cap, have invented. It's probably not the official term, but it's a good enough term for what we're going to talk about. So. Have you ever flown DCS in a modern plane with an RWR and suddenly you've got a warning that you're being tracked or you're being fired at, you're having a continuous wave radar missile alert and you've gone and done your dodge, put your chaff out and all this stuff and then press the F10 button and gone to the map like this to find, oh, actually there was no missile or there was a missile but it was fired at someone else and it's actually miles away from you. It's 30 miles in front of you. It's nothing to do with you. That's because of radar track oversplash you are being caught in the catchment area of a stt and your radar warning system your passive alert system that, that alerts you that you're being painted or spiked by radar has misunderstood and is telling you that you're the target when you're actually not so what we've got today is a guy who's going to be doing the spiking otherwise known as locking otherwise known as tracking with a modern airborne radar he will be locking this guy who is the defender behind them is me i'm an innocent bystander that's got nothing to do with this fire i'm a neutral but i'm going to get caught up in the radar oversplash as we're going to see first things first let's just prove to you that radar oversplash exists and then we'll talk about the actual physics i'm a couple of miles behind this guy i'm pausing now lock that guy up in front of me i'll see in an stt a single target track and um Let's see if I get the warning. Locked. Yep, and we've got that. You can see I've got the track warning and that is oversplash in play, even though it's actually that guy there that's being tracked. So we need to talk a bit about why that's happening. I mean, there are various types of radar track, as you all know. Today, we're looking at what we call the most pure, the most simple, the STT, the single target track, where all of this guy's radar emission energy has been focused on one pinpoint target. In that case, it's the Defender here. There's a big misconception amongst virtual pilots that an STT is like shining a laser and having that laser dot highlighted on that aircraft or on that guy's forehead and it follows him wherever he goes. An STT doesn't work like that because the technology doesn't exist to allow that otherwise that would be great at least in the time that these planes were made that did not exist. So when you're on your attack radar page I might be able to go and see it here yeah there you go on the attack radar page I've got a azimuth and a elevation carrot from my radar antenna. So there is my, what we call B-sweep, that is where my azimuth of my antenna is, that is where the elevation of my antenna is. If I were to STT someone, then the azimuth and the elevation carrot showing the current omnidirectional position of my antenna would focus directly on that target. Now what it's actually doing, and you don't see this in detail, is that because it can't, it doesn't have the processing or the moving ability to perfectly lock onto a target, like with that laser beam example. Instead what it does is it actually does a mini search pattern, very small mini search pattern, in terms of angle, it scans left and right like that. And in terms of elevation, it scans what we call elevation bars, very small increments of up and down in terms of elevation. And it scans like a small search pattern. That is what an STT actually does. It's a bit like a very accurate version of a search pattern. So a search pattern would be, you'd set your radar to say 40 degrees. So it'd shoot 20 degrees out to the left, 20 degrees to the right. The B sweep would then sweep between those two bump stops creating 40 degrees and they're also up and down in terms of bars exactly that but on a miniaturized scale over this guy that's how an stt works and of course because of that the vast majority of that radar energy is not going to be hitting that guy it's going to be shooting off into the background here and as we know radar is technically not true but for all intents and purposes photons moving at near enough the speed of light essentially to the end of the universe anything else that is in that corridor of radiation is also going to get spiked as it's known and that's why i back here am um, in the oversplash area. So we've now proved that we're in this oversplash area and it's modeled in DCS. So wouldn't it be interesting now to find out what are the finite limits of this oversplash area in terms of azimuth, how many degrees, everything in radar is done in terms of degrees. How many degrees 
off what we call ball sight, which is that guy there off the target, do I have to go before I reach the edge of the oversplash area? How big is that corridor of STT search that we were talking about? Also an elevation, how many bars can I go upwards? How many feet elevation to go before we reach the top of that STT search pattern? Also, what about range, distance? How far away can I be from this guy? You know, could I be at 500 miles? Well, no, obviously because of the curvature of the earth, but you know what I'm saying? How far back can I be to still be picking up that oversplash? This is all interesting stuff that we'd like to find out. The first thing to do is for us to continue uh, STT locking this guy here. And I'm going to drift off to the side to find the lateral deviation of this STT search zone. Now, STT search isn't really the right word, but it technically is. It's even an STT. It is searching for that guy constantly and making small radar adjustments within that search pan. I'm now unpausing. I'm going to drift off to the side. And at some point, I'm going to lose that warning from my RWR. And we will reconfigure when that happens. Stop. We now need to determine the angle differential. So from distance from there to me in this case. Uh, actually, I'm going to go between is probably the most accurate way to do it. So distance of... 37.37. Now I need to get my deviation, and this is certainly not perfect, but as near as damn it, if I went from me to about there, 1.45 nautical miles. Now the good thing is that's exactly what I got last time, nautical miles. Now we're going to do, get my calculator out, and I apologise if you can't see this, but so let's do that. Opposite is 1.45 divided by 37.3 equals to the inverse so to the second and to the second so inverse one gives us an angle of 2.226 degrees lateral left and right i won't bother testing the other side i'm almost sure it's going to be the same either side there it will be interesting to see if this guy deviated left or right in his flight path whether that error to left or right would be biased to in the direction he was going if i was designing a radar that's how i'd do it would that be model don't know and if that, is that even real life? I don't know. It's just an interesting point. Now we need to restart the experiment. This time we're going to deviate in terms of altitude. Stand by. Okay, I'm pausing. Please get the spike. Uh, please get the STT. Yeah, what? Thank you. Now, if you're intelligent, you would have thought, actually, in terms of longitudinal axis and range, it's probably better to be me to be level with him. You're absolutely right. Uh, I am creating an inaccuracy by being a couple of miles behind him, but it's really not that much. We're talking a fraction of a degree, so I'm not going to worry too much about that. Gonna be losing him shortly, so let's get ready for that. There's always a delay on the RWR audio as well. Another error in there, but again, it's not that important for what we're doing today. Good. Uh, 14.5 ASL, uh, 6.5 ASL. So that is near as damn it, 8,000 feet uh, difference. I'm a couple of miles behind, but the range, and it's just an average range that's near enough, is 30. 6.79 8,000 feet nautical miles is 1.32 1.32 nautical miles so back to our calculator then opposite over adjacent 1.32 nautical miles divided by 36.79 nautical miles equals uh, tan to the minus 1 it will give us wow look at that almost uh, 2.055 Five. So we had a lateral deviation of 2.226 degrees and a vertical deviation of 2.055 degrees. We might as well just say two degrees. You know, there's always some error in, in the way that I did this. It's just a quick experiment. So about two degrees to the left, two degrees to the right, two degrees above, two degrees down, or four by four degrees. Box is an STT for the Hornet. Will that be different in the other aircraft and DCS? Don't know. Someone's going to have to put the work in and go and try out, but I imagine it probably is. Next is how far backwards can I be? Now, in reality, we're probably going to be dealing with some big distances here because of how this radiation works and due to the curvature of the Earth would call, also cause issues because I've got to be within that, that area, that pocket. I've got to go back, but still, will still be within that pocket of two degrees up, two degrees down, two degrees left, two degrees right. Well, lateral is going to be easy, but um, height is going to be difficult with the curvature of the globe. But the beautiful thing about DCS is it is not 
uh, around the globe. It is a flat, and I've done a whole video showing uh, how to prove that it is actually just a flat terrain. And there's a good reason why they've done this. That's how I would have done it. It makes a lot of computation a lot easier. The same setup. He, uh, RC, is going to be locking this guy here. And first of all, I'm going to try back at uh, 90 nautical miles there, then at 65 nautical miles there, then at 30 nautical miles there, and we'll just see at which point we pick up the, the thing. The, the only inaccuracy there might be is that Wags might have put in a cheeky little bit of code to simulate the curvature of the Earth. Uh, we did find that with some radar experiments, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm definitely, I've measured this true, and I'm definitely within the two degrees so, uh, line of sight. In reality, I am perfect line of sight. Please lock your dude up and see how we go. All right, locked. Right, so 90 miles, absolutely nothing. I'm going to now just keep locking. I'm going to go to 65 miles, nothing. Now I'm going to 35, 30 miles. Okay, I do now have a spike. I'm just going to pause it there to think. I do get it at 30 miles, No, not at 65, not at 90. So it seems there is a definitive range. There's two reasons I can think of this. First of all, they may have put in some kind of after processing to simulate the curvature of the Earth. I have seen that with some radar tests we've done previously. Well, actually, they're navigation, but it's you know it's radiation at the end of the day. It's, it acts pretty much the same, similar to radar. We are all we're fairly low. We're only 6,000 ASL, so it could be that. Or it could be the power reduction versus distance. It could simply be that this radiation beam zipping across here is just too weak by the time it gets past a certain distance. You know, I mean, to back that theory up, we can say that we can only STT track someone within a certain range. So he's 40 miles to that guy and you can get an STT to that guy. Uh, this guy is 80 miles away. You might be able to get an STT as long as it's on, on a frontal aspect. I don't really know. That's you're at the edge of what I kind of understand at that point. So it could be either of those two reasons, or it could be another reason. Um, I'll need you guys, I think, to fill in the blanks in terms of range. The last aspect of Oversplash that I'd want to cover now is radio shadowing, radar shadowing. So can I put my aircraft directly behind this aircraft here, and will that aircraft shadow the radar so the radiation is no longer hitting me? Uh, if it did, then I would lose the RWR spike that I'm receiving at the moment. Now, it'd be better if this guy was actually a big aeroplane, like a blackjack or something, that would definitely be able to shadow me. But to be honest, I'm 99.9% .9 sure they haven't modelled this anyway. So, um, uh, but no, in fact, I will change it. I'll change this to a big B-52. I'll hide behind it, and we'll see if radio shadowing works. Stand by. That is RC. This is a whopping great IL-78 or 76 or whatever the hell it is. It's a big body. That's all we need to know. I'm going to get behind it and we'll see if it blocks the spike. So RC, uh, lock the IL. Uh, we've got to make sure it's the IL you lock. So for that reason, I'm going to go really low. Okay. Confirm the angels of the target you're locking. Uh, it looks like six. Yep. That's him. Okay. I'm coming up. Yeah. Coming up. Bearing in mind that you're directly on the nose. That should be pretty much be shadowed there. I'll just stay here for a while in case there's a delay on the RWR, which I know there is. It's just how it is. Hello, tail gunner. No, there was definitely no radar, shad radar shadowing here, guys. I'm right behind the guy, you know, that if that's not shadowed, then what the bloody hell is. So that's not modelled, at least with aeroplanes. We think it probably is with houses, non-moving features, houses, high-rises, trees, um, because I've tested thoroughly line of sight, and line of sight is affected by houses and non-moving object, non objects, but not by moving objects, including things like big ships. And that's because the code to do test, line of sight tests for moving objects, including radar, uh, shadowing and stuff like that, is it's just a lot of code and processing time and whatnot. So Plastronaut says, just done some proper thinking. Radar range is limited by the inverse square law. The same as any radiation range limitation. Any RWR worth its salt will have a lower detection mm. threshold than a radar. Mm. So if you can expect a two-way return from 80 nautical miles like we can in the Hornet, mm. we should expect to see far greater distances for single wave splash over detection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, you have multiple RWR sensors in the Hornet. Two of them are located 
on the tips of the vertical stabilizers. Okay, so to summarize, we've shown the lateral and elevation deviation of the STT track, at least with the FA-18 CWC Hornet at a rough distance of about 50 miles. We've shown that there is serious uh, drop-off in the distance that we can detect uh, the radar track. We're still not technically sure whether that is power drop-off or line of sight change because of curv earth curvature or whatever, and I don't really care enough to test it, but the important thing is there is a range limit that was what we were trying to uh, trying to show it wouldn't just go on for 500 miles so that's a thing to bear in mind also you know this isn't a perfect test obviously uh, some guys were mentioning that some of the sensors for instance for this rwr are actually on the tail fins here um so this isn't a perfect test but we're so confident that uh, that radar shadowing dynamic radar shadowing is not modeled in dcs that i don't feel that we need to go any further into looking at that hope you enjoyed that see you later